Hey Church family, I'm enjoying this series about worship, the pattern of our worship, moving from our gathering to our calling, to be called to confess and to respond to the word and pray, and also to our benediction and being sent out to live. The series is inspired by the great work of the umcdiscipleship.org website. That's the Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church, where you'll find Bible studies and ideas for for sermons and services and even some youth work uh, programs that are quite helpful and useful, especially when creativity is at its lowest ebb. So be blessed and good to speak to you again. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time the mourning was over, David had brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing King David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there are two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal, for the traveler had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. King David burned with anger against this man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then prophet Nathan said to King David, You are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I even gave you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then King David said to prophet Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Hear the word of the Lord. Amen. We also read from the gospel according to John. John chapter 6 from verse 24 to 35. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. And they found him on the other side of the lake. They asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you. You are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. 
Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word to us. We're talking about worship with rejoicing, and this week the theme is the weight of the word. And I reminded us that we gather for worship. That's the first thing we do before we even come to church, before we even hear We've started to gather for worship. Then when we get here, we're called to worship, usually by a psalm or a song that helps us to remember who God is and who we are. And in some way, I think it also follows the pattern of the Lord's Prayer. When we start the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven. It's a call to worship, a reminder of whose we are and who we are. In the Lord's Prayer, we carry on to say, Let your kingdom come, your will be done. And in a sense, besides being a prayer of intercession for God's kingdom to come, we are confessing that we need to enter into God's kingdom. We need to have a change of citizenship, changing our citizenship from an allegiance to the things of the world to the kingdom of God. And today, we talk about the weight of the word. And I'd say that's why we come to church every Sunday We come here most of all to hear the words of Scripture read and explained. They send us ministers off to university for way too long to try and make sense of it, and I think it's only to help us to know that we don't know much. And in all of this, we pray that not just the Word of God would be read and explained, but that we would receive a word from the Lord. I want to remind us that a word from the Lord It's not always a mysterious somebody saying, I have a word from the Lord for you. You're going to buy a lottery ticket and win like a fortune teller or something like that. A word from the Lord is is not just reading something in Scripture and going, oh wow, that's amazing. But I would describe a word from from the Lord as as a kind of nudge that brings all of those things together to remind you what God is up to. I found in my life that The word of the Lord often challenges, often comforts, and often calls. The first thing we see in this reading from 2 Samuel is the way that God challenges David, speaking through the prophet Nathan. And if you listened last week, you know that David has let himself go a bit. In the first week when we were looking at David, we spoke about him building a temple, and spoke about that call to worship and us needing a place in which to connect with God. In the second week, about being called to confess, as we thought about the mischief, the the terrible mischief that David got up to. Sometimes we romanticize the story of David and Bathsheba, but it really is the most famous rape in history also reminded you that David, now at 50 years old, isn't the handsome David that Michelangelo dreamt of when he made his sculpture. This is a 50-year-old David, like us. Perhaps we've become a little too comfortable in ourselves, like me. I tell you, uh, Heather and I decided that after Emily's birthday, we're not going to have more sugar, And it went well. 
until I had a long day yesterday, and she said, you really need some chocolate. And I said, okay. And I went down to Engen here, and seeing as it's a once-off, I didn't just buy the half-size slab, you know. <laughs> I bought the 50 buck slab. That's why I look a bit like I am. But David's fall from grace didn't start when he, when he started looking around the corners to see if he could see Bathsheba taking a bath. It started when he spent the days laying around on his couch. David, I think, had forgotten his purpose, the purpose that God had given him. God had called David to establish a just kingdom of God, but instead David was so used to war and greed that all he wanted was more wealth, more power, more strength. And once you've got all that, I always say that if I was a multimillionaire, I would definitely be a lot fatter than I am because I only eat what I can afford. Finley Peter Dunn said of journalists that their job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And the same can be said of a good prophet. Speaking God's word in a way that comforts those who are troubled, and we need that so often, but spurs the comfortable to action. But how can you speak to someone like David? This is a scary guy. He's just had his soldier murdered and taken his wife. How will the prophet speak without being thrown into prison? And as much as we see the troubles in our land, whenever I see protests and, and, and all the difficult things that happen, I celebrate the fact that if you protest the government or you speak out against what's going wrong, you don't necessarily get thrown in jail here. So the prophet will speak to David in a way that, that taps into David's inner sense of justice and compassion. And in speaking that word, he might awaken that, that inner heart of goodness that's deep down inside of David, buried down beneath all of the, the, the luggage that David has come to carry. That's why scripture will often speak to us in stories. Because a story pierces past our presuppositions and our pride, digs deep down into our hearts. And I'll explain to you that that's why I cry a little bit, but not much, when I watch Disney movies or anything about a dog. So Nathan's story is this. A traveler visited a rich man the man was powerful and had many flocks. But when it was time to show hospitality to the traveler, the rich man didn't give of his own, but took the poor man's sheep. We read, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. I, I identify with this guy. My, my dogs are, are, are my favorite children at the moment, because my children are teenagers. And they're always happy to see me. They don't sit around playing on Playstations or whatever it is they do. But I imagine that this tapped into something in David, because... David, having been a shepherd, might have remembered that one little ewe lamb that, that he rescued one day and that he nurtured and that he shared his food with. And I imagine David when the... I always feel bad for the sheep because there's a butcher coming, isn't there? But when the, when the butcher came, I'm sure David put that sheep a little to the side. I think maybe David could have identified with a certain somebody I don't know if you know this. Maybe you shouldn't watch this movie. Have you heard of John Wick? But you shouldn't mess with his dog. It's a very violent film because somebody killed his dog. David was greatly angered. David understands what it is to care for a vulnerable 
lamb. And so David's anger is greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan the prophet, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. This is how the word of God gets us. Like Hebrews says, Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides, soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God speaks to David in a way that goes past all of the slothfulness and pride and all the layers of brokenness and meets perhaps that inner child of David saying, I think, remember who you were. Remember who you are created to be. Remember what God has in store for you. And that's when it hits home. Nathan said to David, you are the man. And in verse 9, why have you despised the word of the Lord? to do what is evil in his sight. I, would, I don't know if I want Nathan to be my preacher. I don't like people who afflict me when I'm comfortable. I prefer people who comfort me when I'm afflicted. But Dave, Nathan is a courageous prophet who's able to speak the word of God when David says he wants to build a temple. Nathan says, go ahead. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build a house for me to live in? A reminder that God can intervene and speak and help us to change our minds. The word of God sometimes surprises us with a challenge. Sometimes surprises us with comfort. And sometimes surprises us with a call. Another word of God in that same story, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. The word of God comforts us. Reminds us after it's challenged us that there is no such thing as a hopeless case that God is always up to something. Let's not always want the word of comfort because then you'll just always be eating that double size slab of chocolate or the dessert without having eaten your vegetables. Death was the consequence that David wished upon anybody who had done such a thing, but the word of God came to change David's mind, came to tell David, that he wasn't going to die. The word of God comes to us in that kind of nudge, that consolation, God saying something to us. On Monday of this week, I woke up with worry in my heart about our church. Sometimes there's a wobble along the way. Our usual pattern at home is that Heather takes one child, I take the other child, and it happened that everything was thrown off of kilter and I ended up taking them both. Got stuck in traffic and I got grumpy. I dropped Emily off, nearly dropped her off at the wrong school, which is another story. Because I just drove past her school. And then I headed home along Pence Drive toward Pick and Pay. And as I reached the bottom of Janssen's Road here, I saw the end of the rainbow. Serious. It was this just colorful and beautiful further down Pence Drive, and I know the properties there are quite expensive, but I didn't know that they had a pot of gold. And then as I saw that, I remembered one of the comments that somebody had put on our service last week. It was a reminder of the hymn, A Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go. I'm not going to try and sing it now because it's a hard one. Maybe I will because I can't help myself. No, I won't. I'll just read it. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be. 
Isn't that a beautiful song to have in your heart? Just because I forgot to drop Emily at the right school, uh, all those things happened so that I would be at the right place at the right time. And then on the way back from dropping Emily off, this is my phone screensaver, by the way. It's a picture that my cousin drew of a jellyfish shining a torch through its head. Isn't that cool? I thought I'd go and visit the memorial garden. And uh, I was walking around there. I was checking for leaks and damage from the rain. And as I walked out of the memorial garden, on the way back to the church, I noticed this rainbow. I have an interest in rainbows and, and light and particle physics and all those crazy things. So it's not just a rainbow. It's about light going through tension and being diffused. And I pasted this fancy equation so you'd think I knew something, but I don't. Just want to seem clever. But then I crossed over to the other side of Janssen's Avenue and looked back at the church to try and get a picture of the rainbow. And in my heart, the word of God said to me, don't worry, I've got this. Maybe it was just a rainbow. Maybe it was a nudge from God, a God incident. Maybe it was a word from God drenched in Scripture, in the story of Noah's ark, in God's covenant of hope, in seeing the best in somebody and, and making a plan. It's drenched in tradition, archbishop's bold hope of a rainbow nation, and even in science, acknowledging the delicate balance of forces and tensions that allow a rainbow to form. A word of comfort and a godly nudge. Finally, I remind us that if we try to live our lives just in challenge or just in comfort, we will stagnate. As the disciples and people look for Jesus, he challenges them. Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, signs or signs that point us in a certain direction and call us beyond ourselves, aren't they? But because you ate your fill of the loaves. If we are living our lives just for the comfort, not for the challenge and the call, we're going to miss out on what God has in store for us. We're going to become a bit like this unhealthy David. We're going to sit in our holy huddles and share donuts. And reading the Bible makes no sense if you're not moving yourself beyond yourself starts to make sense when you put yourself in a, a bit of ministry and you, you offer to pray for somebody or you, you do something. You get out of your comfort zone. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, says Jesus. The lectionary scripture for today, I'm just going to read the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. Amen.